Mary. She looked a little not so old and a little um, old. Medium sized, uh, half slash thin legs, blonde. She was like, had crazy hair, smooth hair. No, she was in the farm. Picking apples. Picking apples? Picking apples from the tree. No, she was gardening. So, uh, Angel came out of nowhere, poof. The angel said, be prepared for, cause you're gonna have a baby. Your baby's name is going to be, um, Miss Saya or something like that. Wait, how can a young woman have a baby? Sure, she can have a baby if she wants. She wanna have a baby. And she wanted to get pregnant. She wanna have a baby. So she got pregnant. On our wedding day. But when she was got pregnant, she was a virgin, which means she was single. Which back then was impossible because divorces didn't happen that often. Angel came in, in a dream to tell Angel stuff that you and your family have to leave um, Bethlehem in a different trail. They married each other and then Joseph took Mary to Jerusalem. No. Wait. Bethlehem. Caesar wanted to count all his people because he wanted to say, oh yeah, look how many people I have. And he wanted them to pay taxes where they were born. Joseph was born where you, like in Bethlehem. There was a donkey on, and I think Mary was riding it. The donkey gave her a ride because she had a baby in her tummy and it probably, and she probably had a hard time walking with it in her tummy. They traveled fields and fields. I think it was like 1,000 kilometers. First thing they did was went to a whole bunch of inns and they all said they were full and then they went to one inn and said, no moving in, but you can go to the stable. My wife is pregnant. Or it won't be comf as comfortable as an inn, but it, at least it will be warm. It's not clean. There's a lot of animals in there. No room. Sorry, go to the stables. There's the stables there. Once they got to the farm, the stable, yeah, they, they, this, the baby was still in there waiting for them, and then they came back to, um, and then God created everything. The, there's no much more time for the baby to come out. Probably knew too that the, that we needed that we needed to be quiet when the baby was there because babies because babies cry a lot when there's a lot of noise. It's wrapped her in um, a white cloth, yeah, and then she laid her in the manger. It had a bunch of hay on it so the baby could feel kind of comfortable, but the hay the hay hay is not comfortable. Oh, and they also had a blanket for the baby. And a pillow. I, I don't think and a pillow. pillow. I don't think a pillow. Who we'll call you Jesus? Lay me down to sleep and I will wake you up in the morning light. God promised that God promised Mary that she would have a baby and and instead of just a baby he gave her the son of God. Shepherds, they were in the field watching the sheep and then the angel scared them. Said, don't be afraid, I have good news for you. Joseph's daughter, Joseph's wife is has, having a baby. That Jesus got, um, um, that, um, Jesus got, Born, born in the barn. 
I'm an angel of cloud of angels came to um um uh, shepherds. <laughs> Jesus Jesus has born. You must see it. Come on. Go to Bethlehem. You bet I bet he has chubby cheeks. And really cute. They traveled fields and fields just to get to the manger. A long, long time. Like at night time. And then, and then it was wake up time. Then it was night time. Then it was light. And then it was night time again. It took a, day, a few days after that just for them to get to baby Jesus. Yeah. And while that was happening, poof, a star. A star appears up to the wise men. Oh. Oh. That star is so bright. Um, they went to King Herod and King Herod said, may you please tell me where the child was born so that I too will can worship him, but he was lying. He wanted to find out who the child was so that he could kill him. But the people, diso the wise men disobeyed and brought silver, gold, and bronze. And this nice smelling stuff that they bury you with, or used to bury you with. Apparently it stunk and smell it smelled good at the same time. So it didn't smell good and it smelled good. The three persons had a donkey to um, ride the um, donkeys to the um, um the this um the, the stable, the farm, the stable, yep. Yeah. And then they got there, then they see them, and then they had a baby. That's all I know. I thought they traveled on camels. It was probably dark. That there dark. was a hole in the roof, and the stars shined down onto the place where the baby was. And, and the shepherds and the three wise men bowed down, but not the parents. They bowed to the baby because they knew that the baby was baby Jesus. You're so cute. You're gonna be grown up soon. I don't know what you say to a kid that you know is gonna save the world. <laughs> You're gonna be king in the world. Happy birthday, Jesus. That be Welcome to church today. We are so glad you are tuning in. I'm Marina and I'm an intern here at the church. If this is your first time checking us out, we would love to hear from you drop over to hello.sobblechurch.ca or jump into the chat box and let us know you're here. We would love to say hi to you. Today, we'll be continuing in our last part of Advent Conspiracy, where Chris will walk us through a message challenging us to worship fully. As part of our time together, we will be having the bulk of our worship time at the end of our service. Sing along, engage, and let's lift his name high. But before we jump into our time together today, here are our week's weekly updates. We have a great opportunity to partner together by giving towards our benevolent fund next weekend. We're going to be taking a special offering to support the amazing work this fund makes possible, blessing others around our community. Let me remind you about some of our upcoming services. On December 19th, a special SEF Kids presentation called Adore will be taking over both 9 and 11 a.m. gatherings and will be live streamed to our online community as well. This morning is always great and we are so looking forward to what our kids have prepared. On December 24th, our Christmas Eve service this year will be presented at both 6.30 and 8 p.m. with a live stream option. Both services will be identical programs and we hope to see many of you here for this candlelight celebration or joining us online. On December 26th, one service will be presented online at 10 a.m. rather than our typical services, including an opportunity to gather at SEF that morning for a 10 a.m. watch party. Where will you watch? 
Looking to support our ministry regularly? We have made it easy for all. Whether you're joining us online or in person today, please find the option that works best for you and experience the joy of giving. Giving in person or e-transferring are just a few ways you can give. For more information on giving, head to give at sobblechurch.ca. As we head into worship today, I want to do something a little different and read you some worship lyrics. When we are singing praise to God, we don't always have time to fully reflect on the lyrics we are singing. Let me read these lyrics for you. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye, to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. O come, let us adore him, O come, let us adore him, O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. You provide for everything we need, and now we come to adore you. These songs and these thoughts today are directed as worship to you first, and we want to offer you our best. Take our praises and use it as you will. Change us and make us more like your son. Meet with us now. Amen. Heaven come. 
King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. 
What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Hey friends, thank you so much for joining with us today. And uh, wherever you're joining from, whether you're on your couch or your kitchen table or your car, um, we are so thankful that you are investing this time with us. Uh, we certainly don't take that lightly. And we here at SCF Online really want to, um, we want to make this digital space, this point of connection with you as meaningful and helpful and encouraging as it possibly can be. And I feel like this is still kind of newish uh, for us, even though we've been doing it uh, several months now. And, um, you know, we're trying to learn uh, week by week. We want to do this better and better and better. So I'm really thankful for your patience that you've kind of let us uh, have the space to find our way and make missteps. Um, but whether you've been engaging with us now for quite some time, maybe you're a little bit more uh, new to SCF Online, maybe this is your very first time connecting with us, thank you. Thank you for your investment of time. You are important to us. Our mission at SCF Online is, well, it's the very same as our mission for everything uh, with Sabal Christian Fellowship. We really, really want to help people to know God, become like Jesus, and change our world. Well, welcome to Advent Conspiracy Part 4. This is the uh, final installment of our Advent Conspiracy series. And um, we've had some different uh, themes along the way. We've talked about spend less, give more. Last week we talked about love all, and today is worship fully. And uh, next week, of course, as you've already heard, we're going to live stream our SCF Kids presentation, which is going to be a lot of fun. Live streaming is adventurous, and when you live stream children, well, anything can happen and probably will, but I know uh, it will bless you as we, again, meet in this space next week. Um, it would be really helpful if you had your Bible uh, handy and have it open to Luke chapter 1 or on your phone or your iPad, whatever you uh, use. Um, we're going to stay in Luke chapter 1 today, but we are going to bounce around quite a bit within that chapter. Some of the verses we look at will be on the screen, uh, but others won't. So uh, it's helpful if you can see those for yourself uh, in your own Bible. We had read for us just a few moments ago, uh, Luke 1, 26 to 38, and that's this incredible encounter between Gabriel, the angel, God's messenger, and Mary. And uh, Gabriel announces some pretty incredible news to Mary. Well, I want to read some more. I want to pick up right from there and see what happens next. So I'm going to begin reading at verse 39. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Mary responded, and you know, talk about worship fully. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. 
He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his children forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her own home. You've probably noticed that the Christmas story puts Mary in a very difficult spot. And yet her experience, her response is one of worship. Mary really embodies what it is to worship fully. And so what I've been praying this week for you is that Mary's story can help you to see that just like Mary did, you too can worship fully, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, even in the midst of what might seem like an impossible situation. Well, if you look at verse 26, this is where the angel Gabriel um, approaches Mary. And the, keep in mind that Mary is young, uh, maybe 13, 14, maybe 15 years of age. She's betrothed to be married, but she is as yet uh, unwed and she's a virgin. And so Gabriel uh, tells her that she's going to have a child and that this child, verse 32, would be the son of the most high God. And so Mary says in verse 34, how can this happen? Not this can't happen, but how can this happen? Mary's is not a statement of doubt. This is a question of logistics. Hers is a question of biology. It's a, it's a birds and bees kind of question. She's engaged to this guy named Joseph, but they've never been physically intimate. So literally, how can this happen? This is not disbelief. Uh, earlier in the chapter, we do see disbelief. We didn't read this part, but... Um, the same angel, Gabriel, approaches a guy named Zechariah. He's old. He's a, a priest. And he's been married to decades for, uh, to his wife, Elizabeth. And they have no children. And so Gabriel says to Zechariah, you and your wife, Elizabeth, are going to have a son. You're going to name him John. And Zechariah did not believe. He doubted what Gabriel had said. And as a result, if you look at verse 20, Gabriel says to Zechariah, but now since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. Well, Mary expressed no such doubt. And so therefore, Gabriel didn't give her the, you know, the silent treatment, so to speak, that, uh, that he gave to Zechariah. But I think, um, I think we do see a principle here that is worth uh, noting, and it is this. Having faith does not mean we don't have any questions. Having faith does not mean that we don't have any questions. Mary's got faith and, and a question. And it's a big question. Her question is one of logistics. She's not questioning God's ability at all. And, and hers also is not a question of complaint. She's not asking, um, you know, oh, great. Uh, how am I going to fit into my wedding dress? Or... What is Joseph going to think? Or what are my parents going to think? Or what are people going to say? Or why can't you find somebody else to do this? No, hers is a question of logistics. She's asking, you know, in what way can this pregnancy take place since I'm a virgin? She's got faith that God can do it. She just doesn't know how. And God honored her faith. And uh, God graciously gives Mary information and so Gabriel tells her in verse 35 that the, the Holy Spirit would come upon her and that this conception would be uh, divine. And that 35th verse is interesting. And, and Luke, as he writes this, is, is describing, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That word uh, overshadow in Greek is episkiazo. It's, it's an interesting Greek term. It's the 
It's the New Testament Greek equivalent of an Old Testament Hebrew word that Moses used in Exodus chapter 40, where he describes the, uh, the cloud that overshadowed the tabernacle when it was filled with the Lord's glory. And so the spirit would overshadow Mary, just like the cloud overshadowed the tabernacle. It's the same word. It's a word that implies that something holy is happening, something divine, something awe-inspiring, something um, amazing is taking place. Episciazo, it literally means to envelop in a haze of brilliancy. And so Mary, the Holy Spirit, is going to envelop you in a haze of brilliancy and something amazing and divine is going to take place. Just like when the cloud enveloped the tabernacle in a haze of brilliancy and the, and the, and the glory of God was manifested. And so, you know, Mary, you've asked how. Uh, so, you know, that's how. And her question is answered. And Gabriel even goes, I love this, he goes, above and beyond in terms of giving confirmation to Mary. And, and um, in verse 36, Gabriel says, you know, and besides all of that, as if that's not enough, he says, besides all of that, your relative Elizabeth is now pregnant and she's in her old age and barren. And so Gabriel tells this to Mary so that she would know, verse 37, that she would know that nothing is impossible with God. By the way, what is your impossible situation this Christmas season. I believe that God wants to remind you today that nothing is impossible with him. Nothing. You know, maybe your impossible situation is something that you're facing at work. Maybe it's something that you're dealing with at school. Maybe it's something with your finances. Maybe it's something with your health or your marriage. Maybe it's a strained relationship with your kids that just seems impossible. Maybe your impossible situation is this debt that just never seems to get any smaller, like it's not even got a dent in it and seems never ending. Well, Mary believed that God could do the impossible. She had questions, but she left the details up to him. By the way, God never gets tired of your honest questions. God never gets frustrated with your honest questions. He invites us to stay curious, but he expects us to trust him with the details. God invites you to stay curious, but he expects you to trust him with the details. And so Mary um, immediately goes to see her relative Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth is um, either an aunt to Mary or a much older cousin. We're not sure how she's related. We just know that she is related. And Elizabeth is described by uh, Luke in verse seven as very old and unable to conceive. Now keep in mind that Luke is a doctor. He's a medical doctor and uh, maybe his descriptions seem uh, a little bit clinical. Very old and unable to conceive, but now she's pregnant with John the Baptist. And so Mary in verse 39, she comes and she greets Elizabeth. And as soon as she does, little John in Elizabeth's womb, uh, in verse 41, does this uh, little happy dance with lots of kicks and whoop, you know, uh, all of that, as if he's celebrating the arrival of Mary, the mother of the Lord. And he is, uh, you know, strangely, Back in, I think it's verse 15, where Gabriel uh, told Zechariah that he's going to have a son and that his son's going to be different. And uh, John the Baptist was different. In fact, Gabriel said to uh, Zechariah that his son would be filled with the Spirit even before his birth. And uh, you think about what you read about John the Baptist in the Gospels and you just see right from right from um, the womb through adulthood, just this incredible man who was just so uniquely empowered by the Spirit. And so here's Elizabeth with, with uh, little John kicking. Um, she's filled with the Spirit. And she says of her relative Mary in verse 42, God has blessed you above all women and your child is blessed. 
Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because, look at this, you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Mary and Elizabeth both see something um, clearly about God. They both see that God is about to do something incredible. God is about to usher in the most important three decades in all of human history. And Mary and Elizabeth sense that God is doing this incredible thing. And amazingly, um, as God is preparing to usher this new uh, era in, he is laser focused on two women, two obscure, humble women, one old and childless, one young and a virgin. And Mary is just so blown away by this vision of God who stoops and bends low, that she is just, um, worship just begins to flow out of her and she breaks out in this song of worship that's become quite famous and it's, we know it as the Magnificat. And I wanna look at that in just uh, a second, but, but let me just point out, first of all, how, um, how in this, we see the kindness of God. This, this situation to me is one of the most beautiful things about the entire Christmas story. We see God's kindness in um, orchestrating and preparing this relationship between Mary and Elizabeth. God has, has uh, cleared the path for this relationship to take place at this time. And if you think of it, think about Elizabeth this old Jewish woman, she's the wife of a priest. She's been married to Zechariah for decades, but they've never had children. And for a Jewish woman in the first century to be childless was shameful. It was considered failure. In that culture, um, Elizabeth's first job was to provide children for her husband. And for a woman to be childless was thought in that culture to be a curse from God, that, that God had made her childless because of sin in her life. And of course, that's not the case, but that's the perception that Elizabeth would have lived with. She lived her entire adult life with fingers being pointed at her, with whispers made in her general direction. Though there goes the priest's wife. She's barren cursed by God. She must be very sinful. And so Elizabeth would have been used to the whispering and being bullied. And Luke, you know, Luke is so wonderful. He is very, very careful to point out back in verse six that both Zechariah the priest and Elizabeth, his wife, were righteous in God's eyes. Now, if you think of it, who better than Elizabeth to be a mentor to Mary? Who better than Elizabeth to be a friend, a confidant, a, 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 a counselor to Mary than Elizabeth? Because Mary is an unwed, pregnant teenager. Mary too is gonna to be considered sinful. She's gonna be considered by many to be a liar that she's concocted this angel uh, story to cover up her own promiscuity. People will point at Mary. People will whisper about Mary. She'll be shunned. She'll be bullied, forced to the barn. And I think the fact that Mary was forced to the barn had a lot less to do with no room in the inn and a lot more to do with uh, you can go to the barn with the other animals how important it will be for Mary to hear from Elizabeth when things are difficult, to hear Elizabeth say, I know how you feel. And Mary, I want you to know God's got this. So we said a few moments ago that having faith does not mean that we don't have any questions. And having faith also does not mean that things are gonna be easy. Things weren't easy for Mary. 
or Elizabeth for that matter. But Mary had faith and she left the details up to God. And I think we see God in the details here, prearranging this relationship between Mary and Elizabeth. We see the kindness of God, it's beautiful. Well, look at this, uh, what we call the Magnificat. It begins in verse 46. Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice. In the ESV, it says he looked. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. Last week, we saw that God's heart is with the poor. God's heart is with those on the margins. God's heart is, is with those who are up against it. Those with unmet needs, the hungry, the thirsty, the oppressed, the bullied, the shunned, the judged, the stranger. And we saw that God demonstrated that clearly by being born in the way that he was born. The impoverished birth of Jesus in a barn in Bethlehem in a feeding trough and in that God just expresses his solidarity with the poor. And Mary and Joseph were poor. They were homeless. They became refugees seeking asylum in Egypt. And remember, uh, the very first public statement of Jesus in his public ministry goes to that synagogue in Nazareth and reads from Isaiah and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. God's heart is with the poor. God's heart is with those who are really up against it. And maybe that's you. And what I believe that God wants you to hear today and what I believe that God wants you to hear from his lips to your heart in the middle of your difficult situation to hear God say, I see you. I see you. I notice. And so in this song of Mary, Verse 47, she's moved to worship and she offers praise and she worships fully because, verse 48, he has looked, he took notice of his lowly servant girl. She's moved to worship because God has seen her and she knows that God has seen her and that's enough for her. And just knowing that she's seen by God just brings such relief to her soul. Yes, she's got questions and that's okay, but she's gonna trust God with the details. And I love this chapter and I love how Luke uh, pens it. He, he very clearly makes Mary and Elizabeth the heroes of this story. And you can just see in Luke's description how he's so impressed with the, the humble, faith of these two amazing women. And he's impressed with their humility. Elizabeth says in verse 43, why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Humility. Mary herself in verse 48, the Lord has looked. He took notice of me, his lowly servant girl. He sees me, humility. And I think there's a principle there for us. And I think it's this, that the only ones who can worship fully and who can have fullness of joy in their praise are ones like Mary and Elizabeth who acknowledge their lowly estate, humility. People like Mary and Elizabeth who are just overwhelmed at the splendor of God who would stoop and bend low to them. Well, I want to uh, just very quickly point out three things from Mary's song, three observations about her worship. Uh, one, Mary worships fully the God who saves. We see that in verses 46 and 47. Secondly, Mary worships fully the God who sees. That's in verse 48. And Mary worships fully the God who stoops. Verse 49, I want us to think about these three points just for uh, a few seconds. Let's do it in reverse order. We'll start with number three. Mary worships fully the God who stoops. We see in verse 49, Mary says, the mighty one is holy. 
And we don't always equate the holiness of God in his stooping, but Mary does. The word holy means set apart. God is completely set apart from his creation, including us. He's completely other, completely different, and he acts in ways that are completely surprising to us. And so as we notice this worship song of Mary in verses 46 and following, here's how God's holiness is displayed. He shows mercy. His heart is with the poor. He resists the boastful. He lifts the lowly. The hungry will be filled and the rich who trust in their riches, well, they're gonna end up hungry and empty. God is holy. He is completely other than what we are and he acts differently than we do. And you know, we, uh, in our world, we can be so enamored by pride and power and wealth and uh, celebrity, but God is not impressed by the things that impress us. God is not enamored by the things that we are enamored with. God is holy. And he's the God who stoops. He's the God who bends low. You know, speaking of pride and power and wealth, keep in mind the one to whom Luke is writing this gospel. We sometimes imagine that Luke is writing this to some huge crowd, but he's writing this to one person. We're reading somebody else's mail. And the guy's name is Theophilus. And uh, in verse three, Luke addresses him as the most excellent or most honorable Theophilus. Theophilus is a high ranking Roman official who is very possibly um, enamored with pride, power, and wealth. Uh, growing up in, in, in a Roman environment, it would have been uh, hardwired into the DNA of Theophilus to be proud. As a high-ranking Roman official, he's a person of power. He'll be a person of, of great wealth. And it's interesting, as Luke writes to him, Luke very carefully points out how God's heart is actually with the underdog. And that God is not the least bit impressed by human pride and human power and human wealth. This is our God. He's the God who stoops. He's holy. He's different than we are. He's other than we are. And his holiness is expressed in his surprising stooping, which seems upside down to us. And it's in his stooping that God casts his vote with the poor. We're going to sing in just a moment, what child is this? This, this is Christ the King. This is our King. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. This is God in flesh, the one who cries from the feeding trough, the one who stoops down and washes feet. He's holy, set apart, entirely unlike us. He's the God who stoops and is nailed to a cross. Well, point two, Mary worships fully the God who sees Mary uh, very specifically acknowledges what God did for her. In verse 48, he took notice. He looked, he has seen me, his lowly servant girl. Mary's blown away by that. He saw me, he saw me. And that floods her heart with such infinite relief. I remember well my 30th birthday party. It was a surprise party, so that makes it memorable, but I very clearly remember during this party, uh, standing in the kitchen, talking to my friend uh, who was the host of the party and we're engaged in this conversation. And my son, my eldest son, who was four years old at the time, came up to me and did this. Dad, 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 dad. And I'm engaged in this conversation. And finally, I look down and I say, what is it? And I remember he just grinned and didn't say anything and just turned around and ran off and resumed playing with his friends. Sometimes we just need to know that our father sees us. Mary says, God has seen me. He's looked on me. And the result of that is her soul is just filled with, with relief. 
relief of knowing that she's seen by God. And for her, that's enough. It fills her soul. And that brings us to point one, which is this. Mary worships fully the God who saves. In this song, verse 46 and following, she just bursts into worship because a holy God has stooped and seen her, seen her in her need, in her humility. And her soul is just flooded with this joyous relief that just spills out of her in worship because he's the God who saves. Look at verse 47, how my soul rejoices in God, my savior. Verse 46, oh, how my soul praises the Lord. Some translations uh, render verse uh, 46, like the New King James, for instance, says, my soul magnifies the Lord. I like that. To magnify is to make something appear large. And, and Mary just wants her whole life to be a magnifying glass that just helps people see God more clearly. Well, let's, let's finish up by circling back to a question that we asked earlier in this talk, and it is this, what is your impossible situation this Christmas season? You know, the Christmas story puts Mary in a pretty difficult position, and yet her response is to worship fully. She responds with faith. She believes God. She's got questions, and that's okay, but she trusts that God can do what he says, and she's willing to leave the details up to him. This Christmas, let's allow the stories of Elizabeth and Mary to remind us, to remind you that with God, nothing is impossible. Nothing. Allow the stories of Elizabeth and Mary to remind you right now in the middle of your difficult situation, your seemingly impossible situation. Be reminded that God sees you. He sees you and let that fill your soul with that joyous relief so that you, like Mary, can worship fully and make Jesus large. Well, we would love to pray for you. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you've got needs that you would love uh, for us to join you in praying. We would be honored to do that. And you can communicate your prayer requests to us. There's a number of ways that you can do that, but probably the most simple way to do that is just to email us prayer at sobblechurch.ca. You can just let us know what your need is, what your prayer requests are. And we've got dozens and dozens of dozens of people who will faithfully join you in lifting you up and that need before the Lord in prayer. We'd be honored uh, to do so. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, you are holy. You are completely other than what we are. And we confess that we can become so enamored and preoccupied and distracted with material stuff, material wealth, earthly power, human celebrity, but not you. You're not impressed with the things that so often impress us. Rather, you are the God who is holy. You're set apart, completely different, other than us. You respond in ways that surprise us. You act in ways that seem upside down. You're the God who stoops and you see the humble. You see those in need. You're the God who stoops, who saves by being nailed to a cross. And your heart is with those in need right now. Your heart is with those who are up against it right now. And we thank you for that. And so our Father, in this moment, would you flood our hearts with the joyous relief that comes knowing that we are seen by you. And may the impoverished birth of Jesus, Jesus in the feeding trough, remind us that your heart is with the humble. In the name of Christ the King, amen. What child?
child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing haste haste to bring him out the babe the son of mary why lies he in such mean seat where rocks and of heaven brilliant like the stars in the wintry sky joy of the father reach through the darkness shine across the earth send the shadows to fly beginning the tragedies of time no match for your love from great heights to glory you saw my story God you entered in and became one of
be coming with fire in his eyes. He will ransom his own. Through clouds he will lead us straight through to glory. There he shall reign forever. Thank you for joining us online today. There is always so much going on for you to be involved with, so please follow us on social media. We'll see you next week.